Hi, this is Mark Sell from the YouTube channel Therapy for the Heart. It's nice to be here today on this very warm and muggy day. Very muggy. So, I'm going to, matter of fact, turn the air conditioner off. Eliminate that noise. So I'll sweat a little bit. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, and I've been talking about wanting to make a video on the um, difficult patient or difficult therapist. And I'm glad to be here to try to talk about doing that. And I say try to talk about it, I'll do my best. But it's a very, very involved uh, topic. Uh, so I'll give you very short and simple responses. And anybody who wants to ask any questions, they could always write in uh, if you have a Gmail account. So, uh, what makes for the difficult... See, if I had to choose between one and the other, I'd say most of the time it's the difficult therapist and not the difficult patient. Too often, uh, patients, clients have been um, held responsible for failed treatments. And uh, I think that we have not... We, we didn't look uh, deeply into... Uh, the therapist's participation in that failed treatment in, in terms of his countertransference. Countertransference is a therapist's, in a broad, broad uh, definition, all the therapist's feelings, reactions to the uh, patient. Um, so, uh, and I got into this, interested in this, well, I've always been interested in countertransference because I thought there was some, such an element that the therapist plays in the evolution of these two people in, in a room together. You know, they both uh, learn from each other and experience in each, each other, and they both need to understand that experience in order to have uh, therapy progress. So what makes it difficult for the therapist to do those, to do such a thing as wait for the patient to evolve? Well, first of all, the therapist, he, has a need, he or she has a need to be right. Um, then it's going to be difficult for the, for the, for the patient. Um, uh, because all, all right, right and smart, you know, to show off, to show how much he or she knows. That often happens when the therapist has some insecurity, um, self-doubt, problems with self-esteem, self -esteem, and needs to prove he, he or himself, he or herself to the patient as being competent and smart. That will um, lead to, to great difficulties in the treatment. Another um, difficulty is when the therapist has to avoid the patient's feelings of anger and love. I mean, when two people are in a room, you're going to have a lot of feelings uh, on both sides. Um, and if the therapist is uncomfortable with his or her feelings, uh, he can't help the patient be comfortable with theirs. And that's why I run a uh, uh, psychotherapy training group, Free Speak Therapist, because the task is to say everything uh, that's on your mind as freely as possible in a group. Much difficult, more difficult to say things in a group than it is in, to an individual therapist, in my opinion. So that's why this kind of training that I provide. And Dr. Lucas, um, I'm sorry that he passed away May 8th. Um, I did make a video about that, so it's up there. Um, but he talked to me, he talked to me a lot about um, himself in therapy too. I learned a lot about him, but not until therapy progressed for many years. Uh, but he did talk about himself. But the other problem with therapists is sometimes they talk too much. So I have many patients have come in to see me and they say, well, my therapist talked a lot. So I say, well, how was that for you? And the patient is invariably, well, if they could say it, well, I didn't like it. And I asked, well, if, did you were able to speak to the therapist about that? Most likely not. It's difficult to um, criticize the authority. So, but sometimes therapists talk too much, and um, you don't want to take up your time. The patients paying money uh, for you to listen to them. Uh, therapist as the interpreter. Well, this is, goes back to the classical position of analyst role as in making interpretations, which I have left behind because I think that I want to find out what that person's interpretation is of their life, their experience, and not uh, impose my, uh, my own ideas. And that goes for most things. You're not there to preach to uh, someone, to uh, give them advice, unless they need it to protect themselves and they're in danger. 
but generally speaking, they, they want to find their own answers. And you're not, um, the interpreter's kind of like the wise person that hands down knowledge. Well, we, we want to help somebody become wise. They generally are wise, but something blocks their um, ability to understand things about themselves. And that's what we have to do as a therapist is try to, try to clear the road of the brambles that stand in the way of a person becoming conscious and aware of their conflicts waiting to evolve. We want someone to evolve. I want someone to evolve. And, uh, and, and try to catch myself when I interfere with my process to do that, because I can do that. You know, you can jump in and uh, take over, and, um, and then the person gets lost. So, waiting for the person to evolve rather than interpret and be the wise analyst. I have found myself in that position very frequently, and uh, when I'm in it, I want to get out of it. Um, so, what we do, basically, is not to try to be smart, but to listen. Uh, listen to without judgment, um, listen without um, a structure which we're trying to fit the patient in, in terms of our own theory. If the shoe fits, wear it, you know, but if it doesn't, you don't want to try to force that person into a mold of your own theoretical bent. There was a famous analyst, Bion, and he got up one, he, that was his address at this um, lecture that he gave. He, get up, he got up on the stage and he just free spoke, uh, free associated, but his main point was you don't, you try to free yourself from, when you're with somebody, from all your theoretical, um, um, perceptions of what makes people tick and try to wait and see where they go. And that's a very difficult thing to do because of our own needs, again, to be smart, to show off, to be competent when we don't feel competent, especially with beginners, but this is also true with even more seasoned analysts, I've found. So the idea that the therapist is trying to avoid the patient's uh, uh, feelings uh, Alice Miller uh, wrote uh, an article on the uh, analysts, the drama of the gifted child and the analysts' narcissistic disturbance. Also was published in the Prisoners of Childhood. It was one of the best-selling um, paperbacks of, of the time. Uh, but her point was that analysts, why are analysts in this field? And her, her uh, idea was that because of their uh, being deprived of narcissistic gratification in their life as young people, uh, they wanted to be the center of attention. So what more the center of attention, the patient is hanging on to your every word and under the authority, and then there's the transference to you have, as somebody who's being an authority, either mother or father or someone important in their life. Also, you are your real self too. It's not all transference. And everybody says it's transference. They're avoiding something, by the way. Um, but her idea was that the analyst doesn't want to hear particularly anger and criticism. Uh, that would, um, uh, that would um, injure their own narcissistic uh, uh, need to be admired. So I thought that was a very good paper and, uh, and in my mind no wonder it was a bestseller at the time. Uh, I think last but not least um, is the therapist learning from the, the, from the patient as much as the patient learns from the therapist. And I think that's a very essential thing. There are two people in, in this process of psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, and they are really both affecting each other in ways that sometimes are obvious and sometimes not. But give the patient the credit that he's having an impact on the therapist. Big impact. And that impact can be um, understood by the therapist and welcomed, or it could be, you know, shut aside, put away. Uh, but there's definitely an evolution, evolution of something happening between two people in that room. And uh, that, that needs to really be addressed and understood. And again, I also often thank um, if I can think of it, the people that I'm working with for, for, by learning from them and also by um, congratulating them by their 
for their um, fortitude and uh, ability to be in this room and to take risks, because that's what life is all about if we don't take risks. And we don't free speak. Um, you know, we don't, we don't really get to know our internal world. That's why this mindfulness is such a preoccupation with people. It is a very good, I mean, it's very popular now, but mindless mindfulness. Back, back in the day, that's way, way back in the early, late 1800s, the early 1800s, Freud talked about free association. And he said, think of it as you're on, on a train and you're watching all the uh, scenes as you go by, sitting in a seat as the train moves to the, moves to the scenery and the environment, and you're observing everything that you see. And then, but here in therapy, you speak aloud, whatever you see. So this is a very important concept. Free speech, free association. And so back to my group, the training group, free, free, free speaking for, for therapists. If the therapist can't free speak in a group, out loud and tolerate the shame and all the feelings, he is not going to be able or she is not going to be able to uh, help that person say everything out loud also. So with that in mind, I hope that gives you a little um, uh, uh, idea of what, what this topic is all about, about difficult patient, difficult uh, uh, therapist. And my research into the incidence of erotic countertransference in social work practice was based on my idea uh, that I've had long held uh, that the countertransference is, is the issue in, in treatment. So I investigated how what was the incidence of, uh, of therapists having erotic uh, feelings towards their, their patients because it was always the female patient created the difficult uh, um, the difficulty in the treatment because of their insistence on being loved, on being um, admired sexually. But that, that, wasn't, that was only the half of the picture. The other half was the therapist's inability to deal with their own feelings. So they blamed, the blame was on the poor female patient, mostly female, but it could be a male patients too, only more, mostly male female patients were written about. So that's it for today. This is Mark Sell from the YouTube channel Therapy for the Heart. And again, I miss Dr. Lucas very much. May 8th he died, May 7th I was able to see him, and that's all on a video if you care to, uh, you know, to, to capture you know, a little bit of that. So if you like the channel, please press the like button on the video, and if you want us to subscribe, you'll get all the videos automatically, and uh, in order to do that, to make comments on the videos, you can, you, have a, you can get a Gmail account if you don't have one, and that will allow you access to make comments, and I do uh, indeed uh, uh, get back to people when they ask a question or make a comment. And I also have a list of many of the responses on uh, MarkSell.com psychotherapy videos, so you can you can see who's who said what. And I always get permission for people when they make remarks and comments. So thanks a lot, Mark Sell, signing off now for YouTube channel Therapy for the Heart. All okay. right, have a heart. We have a lot of heart in this world. Sometimes we need to just dis discover it. All right, bye-bye.